into another historical perspective for the Institute of National Affairs. Tonight our featured speaker is Dr. Michael Kamen, but first I'll preview tomorrow's events for you. First of all, at noon tomorrow we'll have the film Underground, and that'll look at the, at the Radical Weather Underground group and some of the, the strange things they did, they did during <laughs> strange times in the 60s and so forth. And then at 3 o'clock we'll have Dr. Wall from Grinnell College coming here, and he'll be talking on Ronald Reagan, our first postmodern president. And finally at 8 o'clock, in Benton Auditorium at Schumann Building, we'll have a political confrontation of sorts between Lynn Cutler, the vice chairwoman of the Democratic Party, and Terry Dolan, the political heavyweight for the National Conservative Political Action Caucus. As I said, our, 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 <laughs> our featured guest tonight is Dr. Michael Kamen. He's, he's won so many awards that I scarcely know how to tell you his most impressive ones, but he graduated from Harvard in 1964. That's where he got his PhD. He's a recipient of the Pulitzer Prize in 1973 for People of Paradox, an inquiry concerning the origins of American civilization. He became well-known to the public also for being the host and moderator for the National Public Radio's State of the Union, and that was during the bicentennial year. Another accomplishment that, that is rather unique is that he was the first American to hold a chair in American history at the Center of Historical Research in Paris, and that was during the, this last year. And finally, while it may not be a national honor, he was also a director of society director of the Society for the Humanities at Cornell College from 1977 to 1980. And he says this helped give him perspective on how all the humanities interact in our society. And he just really enjoyed it. <laughs> and, uh, and finally, in the, in the last 24 hours, I've also discovered that Dr. Kamen is a very gracious individual and an excellent conversationalist. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Michael Kamen. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me adequately? No problems? Okay, if I go too fast, please, please indicate that there's a problem. I'm glad to be back in Ames. Uh, after a six-year interval since my last visit. Uh, I think that it was about 40 or 50 degrees warmer when I arrived in the Des Moines airport last night than it was a week ago when President Reagan arrived. And although I, I very much enjoy interpreting symbolism in American culture, I have the foggiest notion what symbolism to attach to that. Uh, he has his budget problems and I have mine, but there are, there are certainly some ideological differences between us. I want to present to you tonight a problem, a symptom, an argument, and a lot of sweeping generalizations. The first three will take about five minutes. The sweeping generalizations will take until about 11 o'clock tonight when I go to the Des Moines airport. The, the problem is designed to be exemplary, and it's one of many I might have chosen to set the stage for what I want to talk about. The problem essentially is the problem that Grant Wood faced when he returned to Iowa late in the 1920s after visiting Europe and deciding that he did not wish to be a part of the lost generation, when he decided that his vocation as an artist had to do uh, or could best be nourished by American sources and by the American environment and not by European stimuli and not by the European environment. So he returned to Iowa, determined to develop his talents here, and determined to discover and develop a, an American tradition in the arts and to use American themes. As you know, he, by the early 1930s, was painting such controversial pictures as his Daughters of the American Revolution, as well as historical paintings that used, that picked up themes from American mythology, such as Paul Revere's Ride. And the problem that Grant Wood faced 
was simply how to invoke the American past without being the captive of or without seeing the American past through the glasses of people like the Daughters of the American Revolution uh, for whom, uh, from whom he wanted to keep a certain guarded distance. The question essentially was how to use traditional American materials or build upon traditional American materials without being elitist. Or to put it a little bit differently, how could Grant Wood democratize American history for his purposes as an artist? The symptom that, or symptomatic episode that I want to mention occurred in 1936. It's very much related to the focus of my talk. It involves an episode that was centered at Columbia University where a group of journalists and a group of faculty members decided that they needed to rewrite the Declaration of Independence. The problem with, the de with Thomas Jefferson's Declaration was that it was too complicated in its language and it was too difficult, therefore, for ordinary Americans to understand. So they tried to reduce all the four-syllable words to three and three-syllable words to two so that the man in the street could understand it. And as the New York Times reported on February 13, 1936, the Jeffersonian tang was taken out. And it read this way, when for a long time two countries have been a part of the same government, and when one of these countries decides to break away and take its rightful place in the world, men and women everywhere will want to know why. Out of respect for the opinions of mankind, the reasons for the separation should be made public. And it goes on in this rather flat, banal way, reducing Jefferson's magnificent uh, Enlightenment prose uh, to the unaccented and bland English that this group of journalists and historians thought the general public would understand. Why is this episode symptomatic? The answer is very simply that it was an attempt to democratize American traditions, to make them accessible to the American people, something uh, that was very much on the minds of a great many Americans uh, beginning during the 1920s and accelerating uh, in intensity as a phenomenon during the 1930s. The argument that I want to present to you is essentially this, that in the century, roughly, since the 1870s, a very profound transformation has occurred in American culture, a transformation that has essentially been neglected by historians, but a transformation that opens up the complexity of the relationship between myth and reality in American history and culture. Now come all the sweeping generalizations. And to each one, I'm aware, there are significant exceptions uh, that one could point to and in self-defense, I will simply plead that uh, I could have devoted the entire presentation, for example, to Grant Wood and Constance Rourke as exemplars of the transformation that I want to talk about, which primarily took place during the 1920s and 1930s. I hope I've made the right decision in feeling that it would be more meaningful to cover more ground uh, in somewhat less detail and try to give you a sense of the whole panorama of of what happened uh, with respect to this transformation. I want to suggest to you that for the first two and a half centuries of American history, during the 17th and the 18th and the first half of the 19th centuries, most Americans, not all, but most Americans had relatively little interest in or use for history. They spoke with, frequent, uh, with frequency about the burden of the past. It's the title of the first chapter of a classic work by R.W.B. Lewis called The American Adam. And he's quoting from individuals during the first half of the 19th century who spoke about the burden of the past, the need to be present-minded and future-oriented. Sidney Mead, one of the most distinguished American church historians, has argued that the diversity of Americans who came here, or diversity of peoples who came to America, during the first two and a half centuries of its history meant that they did not share a common past. What they shared was a common interest in the present and a common hope for or a common sense of opportunism 
about the future. There are various illustrations or various, various individuals, theologians like Isaac Bacchus or politicians like James Madison, one could use to illustrate uh, my argument that Americans were, were very present-minded. I think if you uh, bring to mind the classic writers of the American Renaissance, Emerson, Thoreau, Whitman, the great writers of the mid-19th century, most of them uh, essentially reiterated this theme. What have we to do with the sacredness of tradition, was the way Ralph Waldo Emerson put it. Hawthorne stands as a partial exception uh, to, the, to my generalization. Hawthorne had a deep interest in, in the New England past. And Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was perhaps the first major uh, and popular writer in America to use the stuff of American history uh, to create myths and legends, specifically Hiawatha, which was published in 1855 and which was an immense success. But the mere fact that Longfellow's Hiawatha was cast in the form of a Scandinavian epic and borrowed heavily from, uh, from uh, Scandinavian epic forms and essentially uh, corrupted uh, or conflated the history of the Iroquois with the history of Indians living in Minnesota uh, was a fairly typical example of the, the way in which American history was appropriated, misused, and exploited uh, by people uh, who felt that the creation of imaginative literature was more important than conveying to the American people an accurate sense of what their own past had been. There were Americans during the first half of the 19th century who argued that we had physical emblems of tradition that were more significant than the cathedrals and historic sites of Europe. What they were referring to were our great natural wonders, our great canyons, great falls, the natural bridge, Niagara Falls, the great wonders of, of the American West. And they argued that these were our cathedrals, these were our historic sites, and their age was to be measured not in centuries, but in millennia, and that therefore they were far more impressive than uh, the sources of tradition and memory in, in Europe. That was an argument based upon expediency because we simply did not have uh, the, same, uh, the same kinds of, of physical and historical sites and remains that Europeans had. Immediately following the American Civil War, a change began to occur. The change took many different forms. One, which I find very interesting, involves the way the word memory and various derivative words like memorial suddenly began to emerge in common American discourse beginning in the late 1860s. Memorial Day, for example emerged somewhere around 1868, 1869. Various towns claim, uh, compete uh, in their claims to have originated Memorial Day. In 1870, an American artist who is not well known today, but who was very important in his own time, Elihu Vedder, painted a seascape entitled Memory. I have a photograph of it with me for the, those of you who'd like to look at it afterward. And uh, it, it's a seascape which shows just the barest suggestion of a face. Uh, superimposed on the heavens above the gently rolling surf. Obviously, these uses of the word memory, or the word concept memory, and the, the emergence of a holiday like Memorial Day are indicative of the, the lost husbands and sons and brothers and fathers during the Civil War era, so that originally the American interest in memory began as a response to the American Civil War. But very rapidly, during the remaining 30 years of the 19th century and on into the 20th century, memory took on a much broader and larger connotations, having to do with the collective memory of an entire society, or for that matter, of an entire civilization. Another example that I might uh, suggest to you is a work of sculpture by Daniel Chester French, who was the, the greatest American sculptor of the uh, period, say, 1875 to 1920. Uh, he's best known for his seated Abraham Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. He also did the Minuteman, the famous Minuteman at the Rood Bridge at Concord in Massachusetts. 
Daniel Chester French was not a wealthy man when he began his career as a sculptor. Therefore, he was de entirely dependent upon commissions, uh, public commissions for great monuments such as the Lincoln, and the, the Minuteman. But there's one work that he that preoccupied him for a very, very long time. He began it in 1886, and he didn't complete it until World War I. And it was a labor of love. He did not have a commission for it. I also have a photograph of it and, and would be happy to share it with you afterwards. The title of it is Memory. It shows a very lovely young woman. It's carved in, in Italian marble. It shows a very lovely young woman seated holding a glass or mirror in front of her. And we know from Daniel Chester French's notes that she is not Narcissa. She is not admiring herself in the mirror. Rather, she is using the mirror to look retrospectively over her shoulder at the past. So this is memory in a much broader sense. It's the recovery of, of the past. And we know from, from French's uh, notes that this was symbolic of his and his society's growing interest in history. The work was purchased in 1919 by a donor who gave it to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And it now sits in the foyer of the American wing of the Metropolitan Museum. In fact, is one of the, the, the great showpieces of the American wing. The American Wing itself, by the way, I should point out, opened in 1924 and is a very uh, symptomatic and pivotal date in uh, the development of the story that I want to, to tell. But that, that's getting a little bit ahead of the story. The point is that memory and an interest in the past was, was rapidly growing during the late 19th century. It's important to note, however, that during this generation, let's say 1870 to 1910, the interest that Americans had in the past was at least as much an interest in the European past as it was in our own past. And if anything, they were uh, more interested in pasts other than our own because many Americans were not yet convinced that our past was long enough, deep enough, uh, worthy of the serious collector uh, or the, the, the serious reader about the past. Obviously, I'm not talking about professional historians. Talking about laymen, in fact, in, in this talk in general, uh, I'm not concerned with, with scholars, but rather with, with laymen at various uh, levels of the society. If American artists painted historical pictures during this period, they were as likely to paint scenes from the European or even the Asian past as they were to paint scenes from the American past. When the American Archaeological Institute was founded in 1889, it was almost entirely preoccupied with Greek and Roman antiquities, only to a very minor degree with antiquities of the Native Americans of the Southwest. Gradually, over the next half century, that would begin to change, and American archaeologists would find it uh, as respectable to be interested in American antiquities as in European antiquities. The Detroit Institute of Art opened in 1885, uh, as did many other American art museums at that time. And its original collections consisted entirely of European old masters, some ceramic ware, and various other objects of art from the Far East, and uh, a few uh, miscellaneous pieces from uh, representing primitive cultures. Not until 1906 did the Detroit Art Institute, be, uh, did its uh, um, patrons put together a public fund to make possible the purchase of works of art by American artists about uh, the United States, largely, of course, landscape paintings. So what I'm suggesting, then, is that the growth of, of an interest in the American past specifically came rather slowly. A collector like J.P. Morgan began almost exclusively as a collector of medieval and Renaissance and Byzantine antiquities, and gradually began to collect some Lincoln items, and then in 1909, collected the 39 unpublished journals of Henry David Thoreau, which indicated a major shift in his interests as a collector. Keep in mind also that the medieval revival, which was very strong in Europe during the later 19th century, was particularly strong, or, or almost equally strong, in the United States as well. Henry Adams is simply the most famous example of Americans obsessed uh, with the Middle Ages and who believed that somehow there was a, a unity and a cohesion and a coherence in, uh, in Western culture, say in the 12th and 13th centuries, that was lost in, in our own time. And I think there's a very interesting dialogue that one can see between 
Henry Adams on the one hand and Mark Twain on the other in terms of what each one had to say about uh, the, the pertinence and the significance of the Middle Ages. Henry Adams affirmed the Middle Ages and found it culturally uh, superior to his own time. I think that uh, one of the um, primary messages of Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court was to say that uh, the Middle Ages were not so hot. hot. Uh, there was servitude, uh, there were, was a class structure that was rigid, and uh, that if you were not a monarch or a courtier of a monarch, uh, life would be pretty miserable for you. I find that, that amidst the, the, um, the events and the phenomena that were occurring during the later 19th century, Mark Twain uh, emerges as a kind of breath of fresh air. He, uh, he has got a, a much sharper perspective than most of his contemporaries on the role of tradition uh, in America, and he often comments uh, critically or sardonically upon the narrowness or the naivete of American attitudes towards the past. In Huckleberry Finn, for example, uh, which was composed between 1876 and 1884, Mark Twain has Huck say, I don't take no stock in dead people. That uh, is simply Huck's um, vernacular way of saying what Thomas Jefferson had said very eloquently in a letter from Paris to uh, James Madison in 1789, that the earth belongs in usufruct to the living. This had been a repeated theme all through uh, 19th century America, that the earth belongs to the present and to the future and should not be dominated uh, by, by the past and those who are past oriented. Some of you may, uh, are aware of a book published last September by Jonathan Rabin called Old Glory, the story of a uh, young uh, British fellow who bought a 16-foot boat in the Twin Cities and uh, fulfilled a lifetime dream uh, by coming all the way down the Mississippi River from the Twin Cities to the Louisiana Delta in this small boat. And at one point, uh, Jonathan Rabin, who, who has great affection for uh, Huck Finn, grew up loving the book, uh, in England. And at one point, uh, Rabin suggests that in the generation after 1865 or so, and I quote, the essential quality of American life was its freedom from precedent and tradition. Well, I think that, that Rabin does not quite have his history right, though it's not his fault because the topic has not really been addressed by American historians. But Mark Twain, in Life on the Mississippi, makes a very pertinent, which, which is written in exactly the period that Rabin is talking about in the late 19th century. Twain, uh, in Life on the Mississippi, has this to say, the world and the books are so accustomed to use and overuse the word new in connection with our country that we early get and permanently retain the impression that there is nothing old about it. Well, by that time, by the, by the end of the 19th century, there were Americans who were beginning to feel that there were old things and traditions to be cherished, uh, and, and one begins to find people like Brooks Adams talking about their importance. One reason why Americans of older stock felt that it was important to identify our traditions and to understand how they had evolved was because immigration, and particularly immigration from Central and Southern and Eastern Europe, was bringing large numbers of people who did not speak English, who knew virtually nothing about American history, and who caused those Americans of older stock to be very concerned about whether or not it would be, in fact, possible to assimilate these strange newcomers. Consequently, American history suddenly, in the late 1890s and in, during the beginning of the 20th century, was elevated in status in the curriculum in secondary schools and in universities because there was a general consensus that emerged by about 1900 that the single most important vehicle for Americanizing these immigrants would be uh, the, the core of American history. For example, when the Hudson Fulton exhibition uh, took place in 1909 in New York, it really was celebrated throughout the state of New York, but the two principal areas were Albany and New York City to celebrate the 300th anniversary of the discovery of the Hudson River by Henry Hudson. The river wasn't lost, but that's the way they phrased it in those days. And the invention of the steamboat a century earlier uh, by Robert Fulton. And in the introduction to the two massive commemorative volumes that came out in conjunction with this exhibit, it was pointed out 
that one, one of the objects of the commission was to create an historical awakening throughout the state. The editor says that to emphasize this phase of the celebration, the people of every nationality were invited to take part in the parades and festivals, and an effort was made to make them feel that the celebration belonged to them as much as to the older inhabitants, that by adopting our citizenship, they adopted our traditions and institutions, and that their pride and loyalty should be as great as those of the descendants of the pioneer settlers. So there is an attempt to to make the immigrants understand what the first two and a half centuries or three centuries of American history had been all about. And there's an attempt uh, to inculcate American values and citizenship primarily through the teaching of American history. That coincided, uh, this, this exhibit came in 1909, 1910. I find that to be a remarkably pivotal date. I could give you a list of 30 or 40 different events uh, that I think signify uh, a major shift that occurred at just about that uh, point from the, the appreciation of history in general, which had occurred during the previous generation, to the beginning of a focus upon American history per se. For example, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, which until then uh, had purchased virtually no uh, items of Americana, in fact doubted whether it was respectable for a serious museum to own objects of Americana, was persuaded uh, to uh, asked Mrs. Russell Sage to make a major purchase of all the art objects that were displayed in conjunction with the, the Hudson Fulton exhibition. They became part of the permanent collection of the Met, and then in turn they became part of the core of the great American wing, which opened in 1924. A number of individuals like Henry Ford and Carl Sandburg and Van Wyck Brooks underwent a very striking transformation in the years after 1910. I've selected these three individuals because they represent three very different uh, walks of, of life uh, in the United States. Sandberg, a populist, uh, poet, well, collector of folk songs, biographer, and so on. Henry Ford, uh, a great inventor, businessman. Uh, and Van Wyck Brooks, uh, someone uh, much more in, in the realm of high culture than uh, Carl Sandberg, a literary historian. And all three of them, in their earliest responses to the state of American culture between 1910 and 1920 were very critical of, of the lack of a sense of tradition in the case of Van Wyck Brooks, or else were simply contemptuous of the value of, of uh, knowing history or being interested in history. In Carl Sandburg's poem, Prairie, which is included in Cornhuskers, published in 1918, he says, I tell you, the past is a bucket of ashes. And that's a sentiment, a negative sentiment, about the value of tradition that Sandberg repeated a number of times during the early stages of his career. But in 1926, and here we come to the mid-1920s mid when a great deal begins to change, in the preface to Abraham Lincoln, The Prairie Years, Sandberg wrote, perhaps poetry, art, human behavior in this country, which has need to build on its own traditions, would be served by a life of Lincoln, stressing the 52 years prior to his presidency. In the case of Van Wyck Brooks, between 1908 and the mid-1920s, he wrote a whole series of books that were very, very critical of uh, American culture on various grounds, but in particular uh, critical because we lacked uh, a culture, a, a, a culture and a set of traditions that were worth preserving. Then he had a nervous breakdown, was institutionalized. Friends came to visit Van Wyck Brooks and found him on all fours out on the lawn eating grass because he thought he was a sheep. And when he came to his senses, uh, he had done a 180 degree turn and became the great celebrator of American cultural history and American literary history and published a six volume history of the, America, of the, the arts uh, in America, which sold incredibly well during the 1930s and 1940s. Now, not everyone had to, be, had to have a nervous breakdown and be institutionalized in order to recognize that there were traditions worth saving in the United States. Henry Ford, who had made all sorts of, of uh, wild and eminently quotable statements about history being bunk, uh, quietly began to collect artifacts of American history from uh, children's toys to gigantic locomotives and, and diesels. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, have seen these in the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan, along with the, the actual houses uh, that he gathered and brought together in Greenfield Village, which is cheek by jowl with the Henry Ford Museum. In an interview 
during the later 1920s when Greenfield Village and, and the Henry Ford Museum were being prepared uh, to be open to the public, Ford said, we have no Egyptian mummies here, nor any relics of the Battle of Waterloo, nor do we have any curios from Pompeii, for everything we have is strictly American. And he was very proud of that. Uh, it included the dead cat that had gotten caught between two display cases, uh, and when it was discovered that a cat had become stuck and died, Ford said, leave it there. Uh, it's part of the museum now, and we'll show that too. Dead cats are an important part of American culture. <laughs> the American wing of the Met was opened in November of 1924, and it suddenly made the collecting of Americana a, a tremendous fad. In 1925, a new journal uh, began to appear called The Americana Collector, and the lead editorial in volume one reads, Americana is not a hobby, it is a creed. A year later, W.A.R. Goodwin, an Episcopal uh, minister in Williamsburg, Virginia, persuaded John D. Rockefeller Jr. to restore the town of Williamsburg to the way it had been when it served as the capital of 18th century Virginia. Goodwin had first tried to sell Henry Ford, Henry and Edsel Ford, on that idea um, and wrote them a very insulting letter uh, which I have found in the Ford archives. It's a rather remarkable letter in which uh, Goodwin says that the, the landscape uh, between Norfolk and Richmond and Williamsburg is rapidly being filled with roads and with gasoline tanks and that the, the uh, main responsibility for this uh, desecration of the landscape is the Ford car and therefore, he proposed to the Fords, they could make amends for their sins against American history and the beauty of the American landscape by preserving colonial Williamsburg. Well, he didn't su succeed in persuading the Fords, but he did persuade John D. Rockefeller, who then poured about 75 to $80 million into the restoration project. One of the significant things about the restoration of Williamsburg and the timing of it, beginning in the late 1920s, is that a generation earlier, had Williamsburg been restored, let's say, starting in 1900, I think it would have been an object to make sure, in terms of the publicity uh, that, that was uh, involved in terms of the use of architectural historians from New England and so on, uh, we're very uh, careful to make sure that Colonial Williamsburg would be regarded as an American um, artifact, if you will, rather than a Southern artifact. Now, that leads me to call your attention to a major shift that had occurred between roughly the 1870s and the, the end of the 1920s. I would suggest that during the, the period after the American Civil War, we went through a period of cultural sectionalism in which each region was, knew what it could be proud of or searched for aspects of its past of which it could be proud, but not until about 1910 uh, do we begin to, to get the emergence of a sense of national traditions? And there's a very active search, quest for national traditions. For, if you take, for example, the case of Abraham Lincoln. For a generation after his death, uh, Lincoln was very much on the minds of Americans in all sections of the country. But the image of Lincoln, as David Donald has pointed out in an important essay on Lincoln in American folklore, the image of Lincoln in the South, and in the Middle West, and in New England was very different. In the South, of course, they hated him. Uh, or most Southerners certainly hated him for a generation after the Civil War. In the West, he was a kind of folk hero with an emphasis upon his, his earthy side, the folk teller, uh, the humorous uh, Lincoln. And in New England, uh, he was a sort of cleaned up, genteel, uh, yet, a, yet a third type. In 1909, the United States celebrated the centennial of Lincoln's birth. And we can, we can uh, look at the speeches that were made in various parts of the country and see the gradual convergence of images whereby each section gave up those aspects of the Lincoln image that were most peculiar uh, or distinctive to that section and gradually took on elements of what Lincoln meant to other sections so that uh, one, one finds to, to one's surprise in many instances. Southerners in 1909 giving speeches of praise uh, for Lincoln, for saving the Union and remembering that Lincoln, after all, had his origins, uh, personal origins, family origins in the South, and so on. So there's a conflation of images. Meanwhile, uh, one finds speeches and editorials uh, asking, why do we have no national song? 
Why do we have uh, no national anthem? Why uh, do we have no national name? For example, Moses Coit Tyler, uh, one of the principal literary historians of the day, uh, reviewed uh, uh, the, the whole uh, the history of names that we could have had. He pointed out the United States of America is not a name, it's just a description. And he pointed out that we could have been called Columbia or Alleghenia uh, or all sorts of names that would have been a real name. And he wondered whether we would ever have a truly national name. The Star Spangled Banner was not officially adopted as our national anthem until 1931. Consequently, all through the 1880s and 90s and early decades of the 20th century, Americans lamented the fact that we had no national song. Well, there are many uh, themes or urgent uh, pleas of this sort uh, that one, one discovers. And as l only in the 1920s, I would suggest, do most people begin to feel a sense of what our national traditions are. Uh, to give you one other interesting example, of how this surfaces. The, the state superintendent of history in South Dakota proposed in 1923 that uh, at Mount Rushmore in the Black Hills of South Dakota, it would be interesting to carve uh, some gigantic uh, heads of figures of some significance in history. The figures he proposed uh, were Sacagawea, or perhaps Jim Bridger, or possibly Lewis and or Clark, figures who somehow uh, made a, a difference in the history of the Upper Great Plains. The response to this suggestion was, yeah, that's a terrific idea to carve monumental heads uh, in, the, in the Black Hills, but you can't possibly uh, select such obscure figures uh, that no one's ever heard of or you'll never raise the money because it was going to take a lot of money. So they finally settled on George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and with a good deal of dispute, Teddy Roosevelt because these were national figures, and as it was, uh, the fundraising was not an easy matter. By the way, uh, Gutzen Borglum, the sculptor who was in charge of the whole project, uh, was, a, uh, was of Danish ancestry, uh, a great uh, admirer of Lincoln, and uh, something of a perfectionist as well as a fanatic about American history. He's also responsible for the Confederate Memorial uh, at Stone Mountain near Atlanta. And Borglum was very upset after he uh, carved the face of Thomas Jefferson because there was a very long crack in Jefferson's right nostril. And you have to realize just how big these statues are. Jefferson's right nostril is about 60 feet high. And Borglum uh, calculated that after about 300 years of wind and ice and the sorts of conditions that we've had during this past winter, uh, Jefferson, that crack would cause Jefferson's nose to erode and finally the whole face would go and that's no way to achieve immortality. So he uh, blew up the face that he had carved and set the whole thing back four degrees and carved it all over again. Well, uh, my point is simply that by the 1920s, Americans were, were beginning uh, to, to feel reasonably secure about their national traditions. But interestingly enough, uh, one very important dispute arose between those people who were interested in the American national memory. The dispute involved essentially what kinds of traditions we wanted to recover and promote, national traditions or folk traditions. Now, this may seem obscure to you or hair splitting, but it was a matter of passionate concern to the people involved, and if time permitted, I could give you a very long list of the people involved on the two sides in, in this debate. To people like Van Wyck Brooks, and perhaps this may surprise you, someone like Ezra Pound, the only culture worth um, recovering, recapturing, and preserving and perpetuating was a truly national culture. And they talked about that uh, at great length, and I think it, it, it ought to be fairly clear what they mean. A, a culture common uh, to all the various peoples who had their own ethnic traditions, had their own religious traditions, had certain linkages with various old world countries, uh, but shared in common uh, certain uh, certain uh, key events, uh, certain key individuals who had shaped the American tradition. There were others, however, like Constance Rourke, like Bernard DeVoto, uh, like Carl Sandburg, who were aware of the development of the idea of folk culture that had emerged in Europe during, uh, since the early 19th century, particularly in the writings of Johann Herder, uh, the German writer and philosopher, and these people were deeply concerned 
with the need to reconcile tradition and memory on the one hand, national traditions and memory on the one hand, with democracy on the other. This, is the, this was the big sticking point uh, and, and the, the, um, the point of which the democratization of Jefferson's Declaration of Independence is, is symptomatic that I talked about at the very beginning. During the 19th century, when people in the United States talked about the desirability of memory and tradition at all, it worried them that tradition and memory were somehow elitist and aristocratic. They associated tradition and memory with the European arist aristocrats who sat around in their old country homes amidst their family heirlooms uh, contemplating their pedigrees and genealogies. Somehow, if tradition and memory were to be meaningful in a society with a democratic ethos, they, meaning tradition and memory, would have to emerge from the people. They would have to be indigenous to the land, but not from uh, Americans of great wealth, not from Americans of distinguished birth exclusively, but would somehow have to spring from the people. And so people like Sandberg and many others in the 1920s, for example, began collecting American folk music. Constance Rourke began traveling around the country collecting American folklore. A number of others picked up uh, on that. And in 1931, Constance Rourke published uh, her classic work called American Humor, which is really a study in American folklore. Bernard DeVoto uh, believed passionately that, uh, along with many, many others, that American history had been written for too long by New Englanders whose perspective on American history stopped uh, somewhere uh, west of Dedham, Massachusetts. And DeVoto felt very passionately uh, the need to uh, give proper attention to the other regions, the other sections, uh, the other groups uh, th that had contributed significantly to American history. In 1925, I've, I've uh, mentioned several times that the mid-1920s were, were pivotal years. Just to give one other example in relationship to this point, in 1925, Ralph Budd, the president of the Great Northern Railway, which had its headquarters in Minneapolis-St. Paul, decided to have a railroad expedition to the upper Missouri uh, River area in order to, to uh, revisit sites of significance in uh, French exploration, in white Indian contact, in the westward expansion of the American people, and so on. Politicians, judges, bankers, various public figures, historians were invited to go on this expedition. Got a lot of very favorable publicity, was a tremendous success. So the next year, the Great Northern Railroad uh, had yet another expedition, this time to the Pacific Northwest. They followed the route of Lewis and Clark all the way out along the Columbia River to the, the point where Lewis and Clark uh, glimpsed the Pacific Ocean. Uh, Samuel Elliott Morrison, one of the most distinguished American historians, accompanied that expedition, uh, gave speeches at various points along the way explaining what had happened historically uh, at each point. Uh, often local people disagreed violently with Morrison's uh, uh, interpretation of what had happened there because Morrison, of course, was an arch New Englander, a Brahmin, uh, and their attitude was, what in the world could he possibly know about the history of the American West? But in any case, this is yet another example of uh, the interpenetration of regions during the mid-1920s and the emphasis upon uh, folk culture on the part of some and the emphasis upon a national culture on the part of others. National culture uh, is not perfectly coextensive with the phrase high culture, uh, but there's a good deal of overlap. That is to say, people like Van Wyck Brooks were interested in what the best Americans, uh, the best minds in America, had written and painted and so forth. What, Van, uh, what, what Constance Rourke and, and Carl Sandburg and others were, were concerned about was not so much quality, uh, but, but products of the American, uh, uh, the minds of, of ordinary Americans. That dialogue, that tension, between the advocates of a national culture and the advocates of a folk culture was not resolved when World War II came along and put a temporary, uh, brought to a temporary halt uh, this whole uh, developing interest in the American past. And there were some individuals like Stephen Vincent Benet uh, who served as a bridge uh, between the two groups. I don't want to suggest that everyone who was tradition-oriented or past-oriented fit neatly uh, uh, into one of those two camps. There, there are some figures who bridged the two.